Welcome to the podcast for Westside A Jesus Church. We hope this teaching encourages and empowers you to love, learn, and live the way of Jesus. Fear is that moment when your husband calls you. He's like, see, I'll be home soon. I'm just going to pick up some cereal on the way. Okay, 30 minutes goes by, 45 minutes goes by. Where's my husband? He's not here. And then you begin to worry. Did he get in a car accident? Was it the wildfires? Was it a woolly mammoth? Was it a cute cashier? Like, what's going on? And he walks in the door. He's like, oh, happy to see everyone. And you're furious. You're ready to fight him. And he's just like, I just wanted some Cheerios. What's going on? You see, fear takes things that aren't a big deal and it makes them into a really big deal. Our brain is hardwired in such a way where we can struggle to distinguish between what is an actual urgent crisis and something that isn't that important at all. And that is what can lead us to what we call anxiety. In fact, did you know that one of the first guys who began to popularize this term anxiety, he was a psychiatrist of last uh, century. Some of you may recognize his name if you have a background in psychology. His name is Rollo May. And in one of his books, he has this line, and I want to read it to you. He said, if you're walking across a highway and you see a car speeding towards you, your heart beats faster. And how far you have to go to get to the safe side of the road and you hurry across. You felt fear. That's a good thing, right? Fear saved you in that situation. And it energized you to rush to safety. After the cars have sped by, though, you may be aware of a slight faintness and a feeling of hollowness in the pit of the stomach. That, he says, is anxiety. Now, his works are brilliant because what Rollo May will do is he will distinguish between healthy forms of fear that can actually save your life and unhealthy forms of fear that begin to lead to anxiety. Healthy fear can save you. Unhealthy fear can sabotage you. And so we have to figure out a way to distinguish between the two because unhealthy fear, if you leave it long enough, it can begin to poison everything. I like to think of it this way. Healthy fear is the feeling you have when you're confronted, say, with a thunderstorm. We were just on the East Coast, and I love this about North Carolina and Virginia, is that they get these big thunderstorms that come in um, virtually every afternoon. It's super dramatic, and I, I just love it. Um, but if you've ever been caught in a thunderstorm, that's a different conversation. Um, a couple years ago, I was speaking in Virginia, and I was driving back from a church going south, and there was this huge storm that rolled in. I actually have a picture of it that I took. It's right near this lake, and I see these clouds coming in, and it's like super dramatic. I'm like, that is the coolest thing ever. It's like I'm a, I'm a closet storm hunter. I, I really wish I could be. And so I get out of the car, and I run down to the lake. This was not a smart thing to do at all. And I'm there with my iPhone. That's why the quality isn't that great. I'm like, oh, this is so epic. Look at this storm. This is so cool. We don't get these in Oregon. But then it gets super close, super fast, and there's lightning, and there's thunder, and the rain's coming down, and hail. I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm terrified now. And I run back to the car, and I get in the car, and I take off as fast as I possibly could. Healthy fear is that moment when you're confronted by something like, danger, this isn't good, I need to get out of here, your heart races, that's a good thing, the amygdala, thank God for the amygdala. But what can happen is when that feeling persists and you're not faced with a thunderstorm and there is no lion that's coming after you and the anxiety begins to increase. So if healthy fear is a thunderstorm, then unhealthy fear is weather in Portland. It's gray, drizzle, Lots of clouds, right? It's one of the cloudiest cities in America. We're not going to see a whole bunch of lightning, not a bunch of thunder. It's not going to kill you. You step out into it, no big deal. We're used to it, kind of, right? So healthy fear is the storm in Virginia. Unhealthy fear is the drizzle of Portland. And it goes on and on and on. And I'm already dreading this winter and spring like, dear God, no. And this is a taste of what it's going to be like for eight months. But that's another conversation. Anxiety is when it's raining on your soul. It's the gray clouds when you're looking for the sun. 
It's that feeling of despair, but there is no lion. It's that feeling of hopelessness when there's no mammoth. It's that feeling you can't shake and you get out of bed in the morning like, what is going on? What's happening? And why is that? Now, of course, this is a a massive can of worms, but in in the spirit of liberated worms, let me share a few thoughts with you. Um, I I think think one is just, yeah, our, our ancestry. We're hardwired to respond to crisis. And so many, in, in many cases, our amygdala is just in overdrive, and we don't know how to handle that. That's part of it, absolutely. I think secondly, though, um, the, no, don't miss this because I can already see the emails coming. This, this point is so important. Sometimes the cause of our unremitting anxiety, that feeling that won't go away, what Rollo May talked about, the gray clouds, the drizzle, sometimes the cause is biochemical. Sometimes it, it's biological. Sometimes it does have to do with some kind of imbalance in the brain. You know, I have people who I know, you do too, I imagine, maybe you're one, where actually medication and seeing a psychologist and those types of things, they can step in and provide that medical help that you need to try and bring things back in order and help your body respond to crisis in more healthy and and, and balanced ways. And I'm so thankful For the psychiatrists, the psychologists who are in our church, the doctors, physicians, we have quite a few that are a part of our community that that, that see what they're doing as a ministry to help people and serve people, absolutely. So that needs to be said, that sometimes the cause of our fear, sometimes the cause of our anxiety is biological, and it requires a physician, it requires help. But but here's something that that I'm discovering from, from my life, is that Many times the cause of my anxiety or the cause of my fear is an imbalanced perspective of God. The root cause for for me, and I've struggled with anxiety and I've struggled with these things, absolutely. And and for me, what I found is it's not so much the biochemical stuff, but it's more spiritual. It's where my perspective of God or my perspective even of myself is out of whack in some way. And perspective is so key when it comes to understanding fear and anxiety. If you go online, don't do it now, but if you go online and go on Google and you type fear definition, one of the definitions of fear you're gonna get is this one. What is fear? It's an unpleasant emotion caused by the belief that something or someone is dangerous. Think woolly mammoth. Think lion, right? It's, it's a dangerous thing. But, but now 2018, times have changed. We don't have those woolly mammoths. So the, the definition, though, stands the same. Let's, let's put that back on the screen if we can. What is fear? It's an unpleasant what? Every, everyone, what is it? Unpleasant emotion caused by what? A belief. Fear is an emotion caused by some belief. Fear is an emotion, which means like any other emotion, it doesn't have to have the last word. Anger, you have the feeling, it doesn't have to have the last word. A desire to gossip, it doesn't have to have the last word. Unforgiveness, bitterness, lust, greed, fill in the blank. That emotion does not have to control you. It doesn't have to dominate you. It's, a, it's an emotion. It's a, it's a feeling. And when we see fear for what it is, we can see God for who he is. But Tom, I, I get that. <laughs> Maybe in my mind, I understand that. But how I feel right now is so overwhelming. These feelings of anxiety, these Feelings of fear, and I know it's not a big deal. I know it's just a text message. I know it's just because something didn't work out the way that I thought, but I I still feel that way. Listen, David could relate to that. You know, when David says in this psalm, he says, there are many people, you can look down in verse two, many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. In other words, there are these voices whispering in his ear saying, David, you're not gonna make it. David, it's over. David, you may as well give up. David, throw on the towel. You're dead meat. It's over, man. He's hearing all these voices, and that is what fear is like. Not, not so much. I don't know. Here, here's the voice. It's speaking to us, right? Lying to us. It's saying, you know, 
the worst case scenario, it's happening. Your life is falling apart. God doesn't care about you. People don't care about you. And as you listen, the more we listen to those voices, the more the anxiety grows. And I know that so many of us, that, that's exactly where we're at. Like I said, I, this is something I've, I've struggled with at different points in my life. I, I'd say more than different points. It's kind of, you know, pastoring this church and different things. There's, there's always stuff that I'm thinking about, that I'm wrestling with. And I know that many of you can relate to the words of David. And he's like, yeah, there are many people who are saying he has no hope. Because I'm, I'm wrestling with anxiety. You walk through the doors, and maybe for you, it's your, it's your marriage. And it's like fear, for whatever reason, is beginning to be the loudest voice in your marriage. You've been married now for how long? And you hoped you would be down here at this point in your relationship, and you're still over here, and you're wondering, like, is this ever going to work? Will she ever love me like I hoped? Will he ever understand me like I hoped? And now the enemy's getting in there, that voice of fear, that destructive lying, and you're listening to that, and you're wondering, does our relationship have any hope? And the enemy's trying to rip you guys apart. Maybe it's at your job and you have this sense of calling in your life and you know what you're capable of and you know where God wants to take you but the promotion passed you by or there's been some tension with people at work and you're like, I, I, I don't understand, God, what are you doing? Have you forgotten me? Have you forsaken me? I, I know where I should be but it's not happening and then fear, the volume begins to rise and rise and a feeling of hopelessness begins to grow. Maybe it's in your singleness. We have a ton of single people at our church, which is great. And I know some of you talking to you, you're like, I'm single and I'm so happy right now. It's the best thing ever. But then there's also some single people. And I've talked to you too and you're like, man, I'm single and I just want to mingle. Like in Jesus' name, like God bring me someone, right? But for whatever reason, every story is different and you look at your life and you're like, oh man, I, I really want to date someone, get married, settle down. But you've seen relationship after relationship fail and now it's that voice squawking in your ear. There's something wrong with you. There's a reason people don't like you. You should be married by now. You should have kids right now. What's going on? And your fear is starting to grow. You guys know what I'm talking about. We all struggle with this, our relationship with God. We mess up, we fall short short we do something that we now regret and now we're afraid God are you done with me uh, do you care about me do you have a future for me and here's the question what do we do like how, how can we we're in this season of fear like David enemies all around enemies in our own head people in our life who are speaking fear into us and over us and how can we move from that to a place of confidence and rest and trust and peace in the Lord. Well, there's two things I'd love you to write down, and then, and then we'll wrap it up, I promise. Two things, though. These are important. Number one, I'd love you to write down the word kara, and secondly, write down leave the parachute. <laughs> kara and leave the parachute. Now, I'm going to explain this in a few minutes. So first word, kara. Let me hear you say kara. kara. Leave the parachute. Let me hear you say leave the parachute. Now, what on earth does this mean? Well, look down in your Bible. Look at verse 4. David says, I call out to the Lord, and he answers me from his holy mountain. Now, <clears throat> this is where we get the word kara. It's the word call. And, and what I love about it is in the original language, the Hebrew, it means to shout. <laughs> it means scream. It means to speak truth. By the way, this is one of the things I love about the book of Psalms is that the book of Psalms aren't afraid to speak truth. The book of Psalms aren't afraid to articulate anxiety. The book of Psalms don't shy away from fear. When David is facing something, he's like, God, I'm just gonna be honest with you. I'm wrestling with this right now. I'm struggling with this right now. So let me just speak the truth, the good, the bad, the ugly, and here's the ugly. God, would you smash my enemy's face in? Now, if I were God... And David is writing in scripture, and he's like, oh, yeah, would you do that? I'd be like, you know, let's edit that out. That's not very sanctimonious. That's not very churchy. You know, let's, let's put something else in there. Leave the part about blessing but not break their teeth. But God says, no, I would rather have 
a broken mess before me who's unafraid to speak truth, who's unafraid to articulate their fear, who's unafraid to come with me in, in humility and vulnerability, I would rather have that broken mess before me than a fake religious person. I'd rather have that any day than someone that when they're facing something, that they're, they're, they're too they're too introspective or they're too self-obsessed or they're too dishonest to actually say what they're thinking. Okay, David, speak your fears. I'm going to speak it. I have enemies. Crush them. All right? That's not exactly my heart, but I'm going to let you write that anyway. Kara, speak. Kara, shout. Kara, speak truth. What would it look like for you, for me, for us to learn the art of speaking and praying our fears? Because when we face fear, we essentially have three options, and here they are. Number one, we can suppress our fear, and I think this is where our culture is at. We press it down. We pretend they don't exist. We distract ourselves with busyness, alcohol, some drug, some website, we insulate ourselves. And, and what begins to happen is because we've so fixated on comfort as a culture, we will literally do anything to avoid fear or literally do anything to avoid displeasure of any sort. And so because that is our ethos and our guiding motivation, we'll do anything to avoid fear. And here's the problem. We begin to fear, fear, itself. This is where anxiety begins to kick in, and it's where our culture is at. I think a huge reason why so many of us have anxiety is because we're not willing to honestly engage with our fears. We press it down. We hide it. It's not really there. Everything's okay when it's really not. Another option is we succumb to our fear. So we let our fears win. Instead of facing it and pushing back and taking the risk, we, we allow fear to dictate the decisions that we make. We pull back, we choose safety and security over risk and change, but here's the problem, is that fear keeps you from becoming the next best version of you. God's taking you on a journey. There are things he wants to show you. There's stuff he wants to do in you. There's glory to greater glory. He started a work. He's going to finish the work. There's someone he wants you to become next year, five years from now, 10 years from now. But fear will keep you from growth. Fear will keep us in a place of stagnation where year after year we're the same people struggling with the same issues, stuck in the same rut. And God is saying, no, 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 I have so much more for you. Do we suppress our fear? Do we succumb to our fear? Or the best option is we surrender our fear. This is where, like David, we make the deliberate choice and we say, you know, I'm not going to let fear have the last word anymore. I, I'm not going to give in to it. I'm not going to suppress it. Instead of if you, if you swim in a swimming pool and you, you're trying to hold a ball underwater, instead of trying to do that and control this, I'm just going to let the ball float. I'm going to be present with my fear. I'm going to directly address it. I'm not going to shy away from it. But then I'm going to give it to God. I'm going to speak it. Here it is, God. This is how I feel. I'm going to shout it if I have to. God, break the teeth of my enemies. I know that doesn't sound spiritual, but it's how I feel. And God says, bring it on. Let me hear that. Give it to me. Surrender it to me. 1 Peter 5, 7, which I really think is the verse that God has for some of us here today. I think God brought you to church today to hear this verse. Cast all your anxiety on him. Why? Because he cares for you. And th th this verse right now is speaking to my heart in so many different ways. Every time we pray our fear, something happens. What? Number one, your fear loses strength. Your heart gains confidence. Your life chooses courage. Let me say that again. Every time you pray your fear, your fear loses strength, your heart gains confidence, and your life chooses courage. And when you think about it, isn't courage the most important characteristic of a successful life? 
If you don't have courage, you don't have much. Because if you don't have courage, you're not going to date that person. If you don't have courage, you're not going to get married and settle down. If you don't have courage, you're not going to choose a single life if that is what God has for you. If you don't choose courage, you're not going to experience that call that God has set for you because you're too afraid of what might happen if you fail. If you don't have courage, you may not buy that house. If you don't have courage, you won't say yes to God's call and vision and path for your life. If you don't have courage, you won't be a Beavers fan this year as the football season kicks off because you need courage for some things, right? Courage is everything, but courage doesn't exist without fear. Courage cannot grow in your life unless you expose yourself to fear. And so if all we do is insulate ourselves, living the perfect American dream, I'm not going to let anything unpleasant happen. I'm not going to do anything that may cause me to take steps of faith. Then you're not going to grow in courage. And if you don't grow in courage, you're not going to experience your calling. One of the beautiful things about prayer, and this this is changing my perspective on prayer right now, is that prayer exposes you to to your fears. What you've been trying to suppress, I actually think it's one of the reasons why many of us don't have a good praying life, is because we're afraid to come face to face with our fear. (laughs) We're afraid to let the ball float on the surface of the water and say, yeah, that's actually it. God, break the teeth of my enemies. I'm, I'm struggling with that. And I've been pressing it. I've been hiding it. But God, I know that you want me to address it right now. And you start praying, yeah, it, it's hard because there's your fear. But then what begins to happen is that prayer moves you through the fear to the other side. Prayer says that no matter how big your problem is, God is bigger Prayer says your fear is not how the story ends. Kara, kara, shout it, scream it, pray it, cast your cares on the Lord because he cares for you. Number two, leave the parachute. (laughs) What do I mean by that? Well, check this out. I love this verse. Verse five, David says, I lie down and sleep and I wake again. Because the Lord sustains me. Um, I I think this this next part of the message um, could actually change some of our lives. Um, These thoughts have actually been changing my life recently. And and I think it's a total game changer. David says, you know, after giving my fears to God, kara, I'm shouting it. He then says, I am going to make an intentional choice to not let my fear be my focus. I've prayed about it, and I've wrestled it through, and I've thought about it, and I've given it to you, but now, God, I'm letting go. I'm gonna lay down, I'm gonna fall asleep, I'm gonna take a nap, and I know, God, that you will sustain me. Isn't it interesting that David uses the analogy of sleep? Why? What is sleep? Sleep is essentially the surrender of control. (laughs) Sleep says, I don't have to have this all figured out tonight. Sleep says, yeah, I've been wrestling with it, but now is the time to let it go. Sleep, have you noticed, and there's all kinds of research on this, that when you sleep, it kind of resets your emotions and it recalibrates your thinking. Have you noticed that This happened to me a couple days ago, actually. Late at night, and something's going through your head. What's going on? The text message, whatever. And your mind's going in all these different directions, running a million miles an hour. And then you go to sleep. And have you noticed when you wake up in the morning so many times, you wake up and you're like, that was stupid. (laughs) Why was I so worried about that? Sleep is the surrender of control And when you sleep, well, not to discourage you, but sleep is kind of a mini death. You're basically dying because anything can happen when you're asleep. You're like, gee, thanks. Now I'm not going to sleep tonight. (laughs) But but it's true, right? Like you go to bed, you sleep, anything can happen. You, You basically die. You're vulnerable. And then God wakes you up in the morning. It's a resurrection. It's a new opportunity. Whoa, I made it through the night. Praise God. There's something that happens when we sleep. Now, we could talk about, and there's a ton of research right now on this very subject with psychiatry, psychology. Doctors are saying sleep is so vital. But this is true at a spiritual level. Something happens when we say, God, I'm going to give this to you now. 
Here, here's a verse I want you to write down. It, this is huge. Genesis chapter 15. Genesis 15, verse 1. God says to Abraham, he says, Abraham, don't be afraid because I am your shield. Now, there's a ton of Bible scholars, commentators, rabbis, theologians who say when David wrote Psalm chapter 3, he's actually basing it on Psalm or Genesis chapter 15. And we could take hours on this. We won't. Don't worry. Like, praise God. But check this out later. Get Genesis 15, open your Bible, and then open it to, to Psalm 3 and go through the two stories, and you'll notice, oh, similar language, similar words, similar ideas. I'm your shield. I'm your great reward. Psalm 3, Lord, you are a shield around me. You're my glory. You're the lifter of my head. You're a shield? Yeah, because in the ancient world, shields, the, the big ones would cover from your head to your feet, and they would go around you. With one exception, there was one part of your body that a shield did not cover. Does anyone know what part of the body that was? Yeah, it's your back. Because the only way that fear can win in your life is if you run away. And we gotta stand our ground. We gotta trust in the promises of God. We've gotta believe that he who started a work in us will be faithful to complete it, that he's the author and the perfecter of our faith. It's the shield. I, I'm holding the shield. I'm trusting in you. I'm not gonna run away from my fears. Abraham, don't fear. And Abraham was afraid. You can look at the story. There was a ton of stuff happening in his life, things that he was worried about, and God gives him that promise, don't be afraid. And you know what Abraham did? I love this, because some of you are this way too. He hears this promise, and then he says, God, I wanna, I wanna get this in writing. You give me this promise, but can we turn it into a contract? This is a crazy story. I love it though. In the ancient world, if you wanted to make a contract with someone. Now it's pen and paper, right? Back then, they, they had a totally different way of doing it, and to warn you, it's really, really gross. But here it goes, right before lunch. This is great. What they would do, they, they didn't call it a contract. They called it cutting covenant. And so Abraham, just the way he's wired, he's like super like control and ducks in a row, and I want everything ordered, and God, you've given me this promise, so let's make a contract. He's an eight on the Enneagram, would have made a great accountant. This is Abraham. It's like, okay, let's cut covenant. Let's put this in writing. Let's make a contract. And so what they did, cutting covenant, is if, say you're going to buy a house, say there is some business deal that you're making, you, this is the gross part. You take a cow and you cut it in half. They put that cow on the ground and then you would walk halfway into that cut open cow. Then the other person that you were making this deal with, they would walk halfway into the cut open cow too. It was like pretty brutal and messy and bloody. Like, could you imagine? You look down and you're like, holy cow, uh, this, right? <laughs> And it was their way of saying, look, you better not break your part of this contract. If you do, you're dead meat, right? It's utterly finished for you, right? This is a way of saying, this, this contract matters. What we're about to do now matters. I, I, I think we'd probably be a lot more cautious with our big decision making if we had to cut a cow open every single time we did that. I'd much rather sign a piece of paper. And so Abraham, he's like, okay, you've given me this promise, but you know, I, I, I want to see this in writing. I, let's cut covenant. God, I, I want to know once and for all that you're going to do what you said you would. And so Abraham cut open the sacrifice and he waits and he waits, and he waits for God to show up, and God didn't. Some of you are in a place right now, you've been waiting and waiting and waiting. God, where are you? And he hasn't shown up yet. The night grew dark. Abraham is fighting to stay awake. The anxiety is growing within him, probably two in the morning or something, overwhelmed, discouraged. Abraham falls into a deep sleep. And then something happened. God showed up. Abraham's snoring. God shows up. And check out Genesis 15 later. God passed through 
the sacrifice. But this is the great part. Not just halfway, but all the way. And Abraham woke up. He smelled a barbecue. What's going on here? And then he saw, God, you did it all. I, I was trying to control you. I was trying to manage the situation. I wanted all my ducks in a row. I, I was waiting for you to do your part, and I stressed and anxious and full of fear. But then I went to sleep, and you did it all. For some of us, that, and it's for me, that's the word that we need to hear. Because we've been so busy trying to control every situation We've been so busy trying to manipulate things and decisions and people and, and, and we want things to be controlled and we want our ducks to be in a row and we want our life to be exactly how we hoped it would. We want our marriage to be exactly how we hoped it would. So you're trying to control him. You're trying to dictate to him what kind of personality that he's to have or how you want her to be or how you want her to treat you or your kids well this is the path I have for them and this is the person I want them to marry and this is the person that I want them to be and the career path that I want them to choose and everything in your life you're like this is it this is how I'm controlling it cutting covenant cut the cow open and here's the problem is that fear is caused by our incessant need to control the more we try and control things, people, situations, decisions, the more that we're trying to do it all ourselves, the more our anxiety grows. Because you all know this, life doesn't work the way that you hoped it would. Life doesn't stay by your script. You can't control people. You can't figure it all out. Life, like sand, the moment you think you got a hold on it, it begins to slip through your fingers, and then what? And what God is saying to Abraham is, Abraham, die to your need to control. Rest. Trust in me. Seek me. Cast your cares on me. I've got this, Abraham. I'm gonna do this, Abraham. I'm gonna come through. I, I will lay down and sleep and I know that the Lord will sustain me and I will wake up. So what about the parachute? There's a guy, some of you have heard his name. Here's a picture of him actually. Uh, his name is Luke Akins. Luke Akins. Um, he recently was on the news because he made uh, the book of world records and as you can see from this picture, um, he's kind of a crazy guy. <laughs> like, there's an amazing picture flying. There's some planes. Uh, if you've seen the Iron Man movies, he's one of the stunt guys for the Iron Man. He recently made the Book of World Records because he jumped 25,000 feet, 25,000 from a plane without a parachute. And now he's dead. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. He's not dead. <laughs> That would be a really lame analogy. I'm like, okay, see ya. Have a great day. No. No. He jumped 25,000 feet from a plane without a parachute. You're like, no, how's that even possible? Check out this video. Isn't that insane? Gives nothing but net a whole new meaning. <laughs> Isn't it crazy? Now, here, here's the great part of the story is, this is true. A couple minutes before he got on the plane, he intentionally left the parachute behind. He'd been training for this for two years. Uh, people in his life, in fact, the Actors Guild, the whole Iron Man people, they're like, you know, you should probably just take a parachute with you on your back just in case something goes wrong. He was thinking, yeah, maybe this is a good idea, have a backup plan. His poor wife, can you imagine being married to this guy? She's like, sweetie, take the parachute. We don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> 
And what, what, what happened, though, is he had talked to one of the doctors, and the doctor's like, well, you know, you're doing this whole thing where you're not going to use your parachute, but here's the deal. That, that net was actually prepared for someone who doesn't have a parachute, and so if you go with your parachute, we don't know what that's going to do to your body. It could be a complete disaster, but probably a good idea to take it anyway. And so he's wrestling with it, and two minutes before he gets on the plane, takes that parachute off, sets it down, climbs on board, 25,000 feet, jumps out, nothing but net. And I know that there's some people in here, some of you, you're like, yeah, that, I'm that guy, I'm Luke. Like, I take risks, and fear isn't a huge issue for me, and I, I, I love the Lord, I'm following the Lord, and I've done a ton of stuff, and he's leading me, and I'm filled with courage, I'm filled with faith, and if that's you, we have so much to learn from you. I'm so thankful for the Luke Aikens that are in our church. You're crazy, but we're glad you're here. But I think for many, many of us, you know, we're the kinds of people who are like, I, I need the parachute. Because I want to be in control. I want to call the shots. I want to pull the strings. I want to manipulate him or her or that. I want to determine where I'm going to land. I'm the master of my own ship. I'm the one who's going to have the final say. But the problem is the best stories are those that don't have parachutes. And I wouldn't tell you about Luke Aikens today if I was like, yeah, there's this guy who jumped out of a, parachute, out of a plane with a parachute. You're like, big deal, it happens all the time. What makes it such a beautiful, compelling, wonderful story is that here is a guy who says, no, I'm going to trust the net. I hear something I've been working for, and I'm taking the leap. What is the parachute that you, that I need today to set aside? What is it that God is saying to you? Stop trying to control it. Stop trying to figure it out on your own. I've got this. I'm with you. And I'll never leave you or forsake you. But God, I just want to cut covenant. I'm going to cut this cow open. And it's bloody and it's messy because I'm hurting people and my desire to control them. And God's saying, die to that. Die to that. Leave the parachute. Get on board. There's places I want to take you. There's things I want to do through you. There's stuff I want to show you. And I'll catch you. And what's the worst that can happen? Huh? Splat, you go to heaven. Right? But I'd rather live my life that way, trusting in a God with faith and courage and the wind at my back. I'd rather live that way at the cutting edge of the kingdom of God than being a person who doesn't have faith and trust in what God wants to do because I know that there's things he wants to do in you and in us as a church and in your marriage and in your singleness and in your calling and in your trajectory and it starts now. Leave the parachute, God, because I trust you. Everything in your life that you haven't done is because of fear. But everything that you want is on the other side of fear. So leave the parachute behind. Amen? Let's all stand, shall we? I want to invite you right now. Let's just lift our hands to the Lord. Every single one of us. Let's lift our hands to Jesus. Why? Because the Bible says that we lift our hearts with our hands. <laughs> Lifting our hands is surrender. Lifting our hands says, I, I don't have to have the final say anymore. And so God, we, we give you our whole life. We give you our hearts. We give you our fears. We give you our anxiety. We give you our marriage. We give you our church. We give you our relationships. We give you our singleness. We give you our finances. We give you all the ways in which we've been trying to call the shots. And we say, God, lead us and take us and guide us. We leave the parachute in your hands. We love you, God. And we know, Lord, that you will never leave us or forsake us. 
And Lord, I pray that you would set people free tonight or today. I, I really sense that right now God's spirit is speaking to some of us and he's saying, he's being specific in your heart right now. He's saying you need to die to your need to control and you need to trust in me. So right now, as we just stand here before the Lord with our hands lifted, I just want you to take a moment and like we read in 1 Peter, cast your cares on him because he cares for you. Right now, name your cares. Right now, pray to the Lord. You don't have to out loud. If you want to out loud, that's great. But in your heart, I want you to give your cares, give your anxiety to the Lord. Speak it. Kara. Name it. Share with him. He cares for you. So God, we leave our cares at your feet. It's yours. <laughs> it's yours. And we invite you now, God, pass through the sacrifice. Like Abraham, we go to sleep. Like David, we choose to rest. Now do what only you can do. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And my cup, it overflows. Abraham wanted to make a sacrifice because Abraham was trying to control the situation. And God says, no, that's not the sacrifice I want you to make, Abraham. I'm going to do this. I've got this. And you know what happened? 2,000 years later, God sent his son who became the sacrifice for us. Jesus was crucified. Jesus on the cross said, it is finished so that we don't have to strive anymore. Jesus held on, enduring to the end so that we could let go of whatever burden we're carrying today. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And here it is. God doesn't give us a contract to sign. He gives us body and blood to eat and to drink. And he says, I've done it all for you. There's nothing else you have to do. Cease striving, start trusting. And so this is the most important part of the gathering. More than the worship, more than teaching the word, more than any of that, the most important part of the gathering is what we're about to do right now. We come to the cross. We remember what Jesus did, his body broken, his blood shed. We receive from him as we let go of our sin, of our anxiety, of our fear. We lay it down and we receive his grace because perfect love casts out fear. What is perfect love? It's right here. It's the body. It's the blood. You eat, you drink. You are literally driving out fear. So right now, all across the garage, uh, the tables are open. Take the body, take the blood, take the bread, the cup. There's also, as Weston mentioned, giving bowls. So if you want to give to the Lord, uh, this is your chance to give and be generous. But let's worship with all our heart. Let's sing with all our heart. And let's come to the table that God has prepared for us.